Here we are at last. <laughs> okay, here we go. Hey everybody, in this video, we're gonna cover how to build a liquid-cooled PC in nine steps. If there's one takeaway, it's that it's not difficult. Oh yeah, I think I might, oh shit, oh shit, okay. But really, if I can do it, so can you. Liquid cooling enables better performance, a quieter PC, and most importantly, it looks awesome. Plus, I'm using the Encase M1 Mini ITX PC case which means it's a fraction of the size of a normal computer, but still has high performance components. So how does it work? Well, when your CPU gets hot, you add a water block, along with a liquid pump and a radiator. Cold water gets pumped through the tubes and into the water block. The water absorbs the heat and carries it to the radiator, and the fan doesn't have to blow very hard because the radiator is extremely efficient at cooling down the water. This process repeats over and over again and is how liquid cooling keeps your PC quiet and cool. All right, enough with the diagrams. Let's get right into it. All right, the parts. Every single part I use can be found on PCPartPicker.com in case you want to recreate my exact build. In general, you need the same stuff as a regular PC plus the liquid cooling components. You'll need a PC case, CPU, GPU, motherboard, RAM, hard drive or solid state drive, power supply unit, a pump and reservoir for the liquid, two radiators, one for your GPU and one for your CPU, fans for the radiators, tubes, PETG is recommended otherwise they may crack, uh oh, a silicon bendy thing to make bending tubes easier, compression fittings, extenders and stoppers which are usually included, and an optional spinny thing if you want to look cool. Water blocks, one for your CPU and one for your GPU, and a GPU backplate which will save your graphics card in case of a spill. LED lights, and liquid. Next, we're gonna clean our liquid cooled components to flush out any dust or debris. Add one part vinegar, to nine parts distilled water. Make sure to use distilled water, which is free of impurities, not tap water. To take your radiator and pour in your mixture. Keep shaking and pouring it out until there's no more debris. Repeat this process for your other radiator, water blocks, and pump, but don't use vinegar for your water blocks and pump. Only use water. Now you can stop there if you want, but I like to clean everything thoroughly. So I bought some flexible tubes and barb fittings, a cheap aquarium pump for $10, a coffee basket and a coffee filter, and use it to automatically pump water through every component for 10 to 15 minutes each, making sure to only use distilled water because vinegar can harm water blocks made of certain metals. Plug it in, and the pump will flush clean water through your components while the coffee filter filters out any debris. Do this for your remaining components, and you're done cleaning your liquid cooling parts. Oh! Next, we're going to attach the water blocks to the CPU and graphics card. Let's do the CPU first. Begin by installing the CPU onto the motherboard. Then, it's time to bring out the CPU water block and components. Don't forget to get thermal paste if it's not already included. We're going to install the bracket on the back of the motherboard. It usually consists of a rubber pad and a metal bracket. 
Hold it in place and carefully flip the motherboard around to secure it with the included screws. Add a little bit of thermal paste to the CPU and gently slide the water block on. Add the included compression springs and screw on the cap nuts so the water block is nice and snugly attached to the CPU. And you're done! Next, let's move on to the graphics card. You only want the graphics card circuit board, so you'll need to disassemble the case. The exact instructions depend on your graphics card, but in general, keep removing screws until it comes loose. Clean off the existing thermal paste, ideally with a lintless cloth, and then add a fresh blob to the main chip. Your graphics card water block should also come with thermal pads, so stick them onto the VRAM and VRM chips as well, as indicated in the water block installation manual. Peel off the film to reveal double-sided adhesive, and then gently attach the water block. Carefully flip it over, and screw it onto the graphics card. Next, we're going to install the back plate. It should have markings where to add additional thermal pads, so repeat the process of sticking them on, exposing the adhesive, and then attach the back plate. Securely screw it into place, and you're done! The hard part is officially over. Next, let's install the components. Start by inserting the RAM onto your motherboard. If you're using an M2 solid state drive like me, now is a good time to add it. If you're using a hard drive, you can add that later. Be careful not to drop it though. Here it is. Oh shit! <laughs> Install the in-out shield that came with your motherboard and then secure your motherboard into the PC case. Attach the power supply and if your PC case comes with a power supply cable, connect that as well. Now let's add the small radiator. And then add the fan that will cool the radiator. I really like the performance of this low profile fan from Noctua, but not the color. So I covered the blades in saran wrap and then spray painted it black. Next, add the long radiator and fans. The order doesn't really matter, just make sure some of your fans are pulling fresh air into your computer and some fans are pushing warm air out. Insert the graphics card, making sure it clicks into your motherboard. If space is tight, you may have to play around with the order in which you put everything in. Don't forget to screw the graphics card into place. Lastly, let's add the liquid pump and reservoir combo. They usually include the necessary brackets to install them right side up, but I wanted to put mine sideways, so I drilled holes into the PC case. By now, you might have noticed some cables here and there, so let's talk about custom cable modding. We're gonna modify some cables for looks and cable management. You can either buy new cables or sleeve them yourself. We're going to do both. Let's start with three of the fundamental cables. I'm going to buy these, so first I used some string to measure how far each cable needs to travel. Then, you can use Cable Mod's configuration tool to select the size and color of each cable. Keep in mind, this only works if you have a modular power supply which supports detachable cables. Here they are after receiving them in the mail. I purposely got black and gray, but you can order all sorts of colors. For the wires for the liquid pump, I'm going to sleeve these myself. We need to disconnect the white Molex connector from the wires, slide on a TechFlex cable sleeve, Add some heat shrink, reconnect the white connector, and then briefly use a heat gun so the heat shrink tightens over the wire. As you connect all your cables, you may find other wires that can be replaced with shorter cables. Check out the PC Part Picker link for other short cables that I bought. Here's a quick summary of the cables you have to connect in your PC. The motherboard ATX cable, the CPU EPS cable which provides extra power to the CPU, 
the graphics card cable, cables for all your radiator fans, and the speaker which makes a beep sound when your PC turns on. The ports on the front of your case also need to be connected. The front USB ports, the cable for the power button, and the audio cable for the headphone and microphone jacks. Lastly, the pump has two cables. One goes into the CPU fan port to control the pump speed, and the other goes into the power supply unit. You may have to get creative with hiding all the cables, but once they're plugged in and tucked away, you're good to go. Alright, the fun stuff begins. The first thing you need to do is plan your design. As you can see, I expertly drafted some very ambitious ideas. The order of the pipes doesn't matter, just make sure all of your parts are connected in the loop. Get your PETG tube and use a pipe cutter to get it to the approximate length you need. Next, you'll need a silicon bending insert that matches the inner diameter of your tubes. If you don't use it, your pipes will bend like this. Dip the bendy thing in some soapy water and insert it into your tube. Gently use a heat gun to warm up the tube. Pretend you're grilling a sausage link. You want all the sides to heat up evenly. You'll naturally feel the tube become malleable, at which point you can bend it until it cools down and hardens again. For fun, I 3D printed a bending tool to get a clean 90 degree angle. It works really well, but isn't necessary. Once you have the right shape, hold the tube in place until it cools down and is stiff again. It's a lot of trial and error, so buy extra tubes in case you mess up. Once your tube is done, you need to chamfer the edges so they aren't sharp. This prevents the tubes from accidentally tearing the rubber rings in your fittings, which are designed to prevent water from leaking. To chamfer your tube, hold the tube at a 45 degree angle on sandpaper and grind it back and forth 10 to 20 times. Rotate the tube a little bit and sand it again. Here's an example of a perfectly chamfered tube. Some companies sell chamfer tools, but those didn't work for me at all. Once you've finished bending all your tubes, wash and dry them. The next thing you'll want to do is screw on fittings where pipes will connect and put stoppers where you won't have any tubes. To connect a tube, first slide on the compression fitting cap, then slide on the rubber o-ring, insert the pipe, and then tightly screw the cap on. Make sure the tubes are snug and that they don't slide in or out. One last thing, it's a good idea to add an outlet somewhere at the bottom of your computer so you can easily drain the liquid when performing maintenance. You can see I added a flexible tube with a valve fitting so you can open and close it like a faucet. In reality, bending tubes and adding fittings is more of a back and forth process as you bend the tube, test if it fits, bend it again to make adjustments, and test it again. Once everything fits snugly, we're ready for the next step. We're almost at the end. It's time to add the liquid. I used a green liquid that glows under UV light and has some antimicrobial chemicals to prevent unwanted mold. Then, you'll want a funnel or a squeeze bottle. Lastly, you need an ATX jumper bridge connector which allows you to turn on the power supply without connecting it to your motherboard. If you can't get your hands on this tool, there are tutorials on how to use a paper clip instead. Begin by slowly pouring some liquid into the reservoir, but don't fill it up all the way. Now, turn the power supply on and watch as the liquid gets pumped through your loop. Turn off the power supply, pour some more liquid, and turn it on again. Repeat this process until your whole loop is filled with liquid and your reservoir is pretty full too. Once your loop is filled, don't close the cap on your reservoir just yet. We're going to perform leak testing and let the air bubbles escape at the same time. Let your loop run for 12 to 24 hours with the cap open and you can add some paper towels to easily identify any leaks and protect your components. If after 24 hours there are no leaks, you should be good to go. It's okay to have some bubbles here and there. One word of warning, this leak test is not foolproof because it was done under room temperature conditions. Be sure to monitor your PC when playing high performance games or other load heavy software that heats up your PC because pipes that aren't snug enough could wiggle loose when your PC gets hot. I learned this the hard way while playing StarCraft II at max settings. 
but miraculously everything was still working. The parts are installed and liquid has been added. All that's left are a few finishing touches. This place is about to get lit. Literally. Let's add the LED lights. I bought a hybrid LED kit from CableMod. What's nice about this kit is it has RGB lights and UV lights on the same strip which will make the liquid glow. Measure how long the strips need to be, cut them to length, and then tuck them along the sides of your PC. To extend the length of a strip, simply connect it to another one. The cable mod strips are also magnetic, so I attached some magnets to the ceiling of the case for extra wow factor, while allowing them to be easily detachable during maintenance. Connect the power cable that comes with the kit and close everything back up. Use the remote to select a color or pattern and watch your PC glow. Before we complete this build, I want to share one bonus step. Cutting a panel to make a window frame. The Encase M1 comes with a solid aluminum panel, but I wanted to modify it to have a glass window so you can see what's inside the PC. The first step is to plan your design. I recommend cutting out your design using paper to make sure you're satisfied with the dimensions. Thankfully, I have a friend who let me use his Shapoko 3 CNC machine and I used an MDF board and clamps to secure the panel in place. This was my first time CNC machining anything, let alone aluminum, which can be challenging. To add to that, I only had one shot to get this right since the PC case doesn't come with spare panels. I highly recommend you perform some test cuts in the middle to get the CNC machine settings right. There was a lot of trial and error, so I'm going to show you what finally worked. First, I used Carbide Create to create the shape of the window. I recommend a bezel width of 1 inch, but I made mine extra narrow at 3 quarters of an inch so you can see just a bit more inside the PC. The most important thing is using the right cutting tool. I used a 4 flute, 8 inch diameter carbide end mill coated with aluminum titanium nitride. The link to this tool is in the parts list on PC Part Picker. Lastly, you have to set the correct settings on the CNC machine and software. Here's what I finally used that worked. A few quick tips. Use a vacuum or blowing tool to get rid of metal fragments while the cutter is working. Otherwise, they could jam your cutter like this. If you end up messing up like I did, you can try again on specific areas. For example, if you need to redo the rounded corners, you can just cut a circle in each corner. Once the cutting is complete, your panel is ready. The next thing we want to do is add some glass. I went to a local window shop and they cut me a small piece of glass. The one I used is 11 inches long by 8 and a quarter inch wide. It's up to you if you want to glue the glass to the frame. Since I used only a 3 quarter inch bezel, I gently placed the glass into the case without gluing it and then snap the aluminum panel into place. At this point, the build is complete, and there's only one thing left to do. Holy Christ, I can't believe it's actually sitting there. People don't usually realize how small this case is. Or whatever, I'm thirsty. All right, we're gonna load the operating system onto a USB stick and plug it in, along with a mouse and keyboard. <laughs> Here we are, last. <laughs> okay, here we go. Um, this is this really gonna happen? Oh my God, I forgot, I didn't plug it in. Okay, okay. <laughs> that was not on purpose. All right, I have to plug this in. This is the moment of truth. I'm gonna press the power button, and there are only one, two, three things we're gonna pay attention to. One, we're gonna see if it beeps and goes lights up, ding, 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 which is what the instruction manual said it would do. Uh, two, we're gonna quickly look here to make sure nothing leaks. Three, we're gonna hope that on the screen, a BIOS menu pops up. 
and that's about it. Ready? Here we go. Three, two, one. Okay. Oh, oh, okay. I'm assuming that means it worked, right? It says, Asus, in search of incredible. Oh, I actually pressed the space bar and beeped three times. I'm assuming that's a good thing. It's actually a bad thing. The pump didn't turn on because I forgot you have to plug it into the power supply and the CPU fan port on the motherboard. Let's try that again. Okay. Ah, there we go. It's spinning. All right, so it's working. One tip, each time you turn on your PC, you may get an error message that the CPU fan isn't on. This is normal because the pump takes a few seconds to start up and by then the BIOS has already generated the error message. As long as you know your pump is working, you can ignore the error message. Next, you may want to customize your fan settings in the BIOS. I like my fans and pump to be quiet during low CPU usage and then quickly speed up during high performance activities. Next, install your operating system. I recommend you install some monitoring software to make sure your CPU and graphics card are working properly and that their temperatures are under control. Make sure your CPU chipset driver and graphics card drivers are up to date. My CPU had significantly better temperatures after updating. If your CPU, graphics card, or RAM can be overclocked, don't forget to check out plenty of tutorials on how to do that. And lastly, you can run some performance benchmarks such as 3 d Mark. Finally, the moment we have been waiting for. The PC build is done. Here's a quick recap of all nine steps. Let me know if this video was helpful or if you have any questions, and thanks for watching.